Everyone knows that Genda Industries is known for their reed knives, sharpening, and overall amazing quality and service in the double reed world. But there is so much more going on at Genda Industries. Did you know you can get oboe and bassoon reeds from Genda Industries Artisan Mall? The Genda Industries Artisan Mall is like a farmer's market filled with talented local and regional reed makers selling their reeds. It's a great way to try out some new reeds from new makers. Who knows? One day they may be your reeds for sale. Add the code DRDGENDA, all caps, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda reed knife, maintenance kit, reed knife sharpening book, cutting block, and reed tool roll. Visit them at www.gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're more than just reed knives. Hey, oboists, have you checked out MKL Reads lately? MKL is the one-stop shop for handmade oboe reads where you can try reads from various makers and then select the one that is best for you. How cool is that? Visit mklreads.com and enter coupon code double space read space dish, all caps, for free shipping on your first order. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Okay, Galee, I got my coffee. It's Saturday morning. I'm ready to dish. It has been a whirlwind few weeks. First of all, I feel like I haven't talked to you at all, which I don't like. I know. I feel like our the primary communication has been podcast-based, which is really unacceptable. <laughs> the listeners obviously don't know, but we can average like, what would you say, 25 texts a day? I mean, it's enough that your husband is like... <laughs> Why are you texting her so much? <laughs> Shout out, Chris. <laughs> Spousal side eye. <laughs> but listen, it's important to maintain our friendship. You can't take your friends for granted because they're actually like there aren't as many true friends in your lifetime as you would maybe hope for. <laughs> well, I saw a meme on the internet the other day that was like, no one talks about Jesus's miracle of having 12 close friends in his 30s. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I thought that yes. was so funny. I related to that a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> music people, you know, a lot of times we make really great friendships in school and then we scatter about the country. So long distance friendships have to be carefully cultivated and maintained. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you why I've been so busy in MIA? Please. I gave three recitals in three weeks and I'm a little bit tired, but I also feel good about it because as you know, giving recitals is the thing that I want to do the most, but it's also the thing that gives me the most fear. Mm -hmm. So I've just in the last couple of years been really trying to tackle that fear head on. And so I'll tell you, it didn't look so bad on paper, but when I realized I scheduled three recitals in three weeks, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> so where did you go? Well, I did a recital at University of Southern Mississippi, my home base, my hometown crowd. And it was really great. It was called Feeling Back. And it was a collaboration between me and Ellen Elder, my um, collaborative partner at USM, and our musicology colleague at Hafer. And he did a 15-minute lecture at the beginning of the recitals, contextualizing the pieces I played, the sonata for oboe and piano by Hans Gall and the suite by Pavel Haas, um, both of whom are composers who were affected by um, World War II and the Holocaust, although in different ways. Mm -hmm. So he did a little talk at the beginning putting it all into a frame and then I'm standing there backstage like holding back tears while he's talking and then I come out and get to play these incredible works and it was really really wonderful there were community members there and students there and colleagues and it just went over great 
um, because we never actually get to really say why these pieces are so meaningful to us, if they are. Well, and you forgot Hannah and Franklin Kaunitz. Yeah, and my friend Joanna was there, so she came all the way down from Montana to see it, which was so awesome. <laughs> so I had my parents and my friend and, and my wife, and it was really great. It was really wonderful. Uh, then I went over to Arkansas State and shout out to the Arkansas State Oboes. I got to give a master class and uh, the same pieces in recital plus the Simon Sargon homage to Hafiz, which is one of my favorite pieces to play on earth. And huge shout out to Kristen Letterman for having me out. We're doing an exchange. She's going to come down to USM later this month. And uh, then I just got back from Central Michigan University where I got to work with the oboes there. Um, and I got to hang out with Linda Beth Binkley and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And uh, now I'm back and my luggage is not here. So I get to take a break from making reads because my read knives are in my bag. <laughs> You have a great excuse. I do. I'm just laying around reading my book. It's weird. Oh, I should, con to contextualize this now, I should say that my grandparents on my dad's side are Holocaust escapees from Germany. So, you know, I have memories of, you know, of them and family lore and all of these things. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that just makes you feel really grateful to be alive, you know, because if they hadn't escaped, I wouldn't be alive. So it was really personally meaningful. And I find that those are the, the most um, fulfilling recitals to give when it's something that I actually care about, then I give it that extra thousand percent. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It makes sense. That's kind of the same with me. And I'm very enthusiastic about collaborating with Native American composers and have several projects based around that. So I totally, I smell what you're stepping in. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have not heard that phrase before. <laughs> Anyway, enough about me. How are you? I'm good. It's that time of the semester where everyone's kind of feeling the busyness, you know? Oh, yeah. My upcoming week is a little bit bonkers. Later on today, I will welcome my mother and father-in-law for a visit, which I'm excited about because they like good restaurants and good wine, and that's basically what they want to do when they're in town. So I'm down for it. Mm-hmm. And then we go into like midterm concert crunch week. So I'll have a lot of things mm -hmm. to attend, which is not so stressful, but it can be a little bit of a less time available to you. You know, you have to do a lot of things and attend a lot of things. This week in particular, though, I'm welcoming Allison Roebuck down Yay! to do a recital and master class. And I'm super excited. As soon as Allison hits the road, I've got to like jump in the shower and get in a pretty dress because I'll be doing the Weber Hungarian with a high school group that evening. Awesome. Yes. So it's, it's going to be a fast and furious week. I'm going to a fashion show, a charity fashion show on Saturday. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to one? You're not in it? Girl, you're so sweet. For the listeners who've never met me, <laughs> I'm like barely five feet tall. I'm not what you... <laughs> Although I guess, admittedly, the Cape Girardeau fashion shows maybe don't have, you know, the <laughs> supermodels that we tend to associate with fashion shows, but... <laughs> So Kendall Jenner's not going to be there? No, Gigi Hadid, Carly Claus. I don't think we're going to see them at this show. But yeah, it's a little crazy because I was just elected treasurer of the Midwest Double Read Society. Awesome. Which I'm super excited about. And it's all women officers. And so it's just like this uh, power posse of Double Read ladies, which I'm super Ooh. psyched about. But... I have to be at now the Midwest Double Read Society Double Read Day, which is in Lawrence, Kansas on Sunday. But I already said I would go to this fashion show and admittedly I could cancel, but it's an invitation with like, you know, when you have like a friendship crush on somebody and you're like mm -hmm. trying, like our aforementioned hard time making friends in your thirties <laughs> dilemma. Yeah. And so uh, my friend Tamika was like, I have an extra ticket. Do you want to go to this fashion show? And I'm like, Yes, I do. But what it means is I'm going to go to the fashion show and then drive halfway to Kansas because it's like seven hours from where I live, get a hotel, get up at the crack of dawn and drive the other half to be there in time to start to collect dues 
when people start showing up for the event. So that's going to be a little crazy town, but I'm down for it. It's all great things. It's nice to be up to your ears busy with things you're excited about. Well, that's true. It's stressful, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's better than being bored. Right. But let me tell you, do you, I've been thinking about this a little bit lately because the past couple of weeks when time has gotten busy, I've been really trying to not like martyr myself over the cause of being busy. I think that's something I've indulged myself in, in the past that I'm trying not to do. Mm -hmm. And especially in, oh, I'm so busy. I didn't have time to practice today. So yeah. been really trying hard to make sure I get in my time, have certain standards for how many days a week and how many hours a day that I practice in order to maintain my habit as a professional. But the one thing that in making this effort, I've noticed that I don't know if you've experienced this at all, is when I'm very diligent to make sure I get in my time, I have a really hard time not getting behind on the tasks that I have to maintain, like, I don't know, grading or emails or um, writing this grant proposal or kind of the reading and writing part. Story of my life. Yes. And if I'm on top of that, I feel like my practicing has suffered. Like I am I've been able to find a way where I don't neglect my practicing, but I have yet to find a strategy where I'm not behind on anything. And maybe that's just naive and idealistic to even have this conversation. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been kind of, that's the balance that I've been really seeking these past couple of weeks. It's hard. I don't know. Because I've been so swamped the last few weeks. I've been like, okay, well, I'm going to have to be okay with some people being a little bit mad at me, but maybe not a lot mad at me. Like, I'm going to wait until they're not a lot mad. <laughs> How many days is acceptable to not respond to this email? How much time do I have? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then it's also, you know, nobody has more of a right to my time than I do. Mm. So, you know, sometimes that, that means that people are going to have to be a little bit mad. I don't know. There's no good answer, but you have to do what you have to do to, to stay sane, I think. And prioritize yourself, you know, and that's not to say be selfish. Well, sometimes it is be selfish. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe you know. not be um, carelessly selfish. Don't disregard others, right. but understand right. that as professionals or as students, we are expected to maintain and build upon our skills as musicians in addition to being organized and having professional correspondence. So we're all just, and maybe even being understanding with other people, you know, that email that you need a response to really quickly kind of understand that the people in our lives maybe need a little bit of slack as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Hey, let's talk about Jenna Ingalls Reads. She has built her business on providing high quality handmade reads, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Jenna Ingle Reads, you get prompt communication, reads, or cane handcrafted to your specifications and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders or monthly read subscriptions are welcome, and she'll work with you to find the combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that is right for you. Podcast listeners can use the code DISH, all caps, for 10% off their first order at JennetIngle.com. That's J-E-N-N-E-T-I-N-G-L-E.com. We are so excited to welcome to the podcast, Elizabeth Cook Tishon, Principal Oboe in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. We'll go ahead and start off with our standard first question. Could you tell us how you came to play the oboe? Sure. Um, my musical life started, I guess, when I was five, I started taking piano and my mom uh, hired a teacher from our church and uh, she taught me how to read music and it was great but it never like it never really clicked for me um I didn't like to practice and I uh you know would try and avoid public performance and um yeah it wasn't my thing so in uh fourth grade I got the opportunity to try the oboe and that happened because 
I was homeschooled in third grade and uh, in New York State, they they do, they do like this inter, uh, this instrument petting zoo um, for third graders to choose their instrument for the next year. And I missed that. So when I got to public school in fourth grade, they put me on percussion because they needed a, a bass drum player. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I played bass drum for the first half of fourth grade. And I hated that. It was super boring for me. Um, we played tunes like the Macarena. And <laughs> 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 like <that>. Throwback. <laughs> yep. um, and then the oboe player quit. And the school owned an oboe. And they came up to me because they knew I played piano and I could read music. And they knew I was frustrated with the bass drum. And my band director asked me if I would like to play the oboe. And I said yes, gladly. And um, so I tried the oboe, and honestly, it was like it was like one of those moments in life where you do something and you just know that this is supposed to happen. And I was only ten years old, but I had this feeling of, wow, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I remember my first lesson vividly, and I told my band director that day that I was going to be an oboist <laughs> and she looked at me kind of crazy and she said, why don't you practice and come back next week? And, <laughs> and I did and I, I loved it. And so that's how I started the oboe. You must have had a really good read that day. <laughs> you know, I saved it. You it saved it? Like, yeah, it was like one of those Jones uh, reads. That <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. Yeah. <laughs> So moving forward in the timeline, can you tell us about your training and educational journey and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, So I was really in love with the oboe, but ended up falling in love with musical theater in middle school. And uh, I then made the decision that, okay, I want to be a pit musician. This is this. I love this music. It's really fun to be a part of the musical theater world. I want to move to New York City and all this stuff. So I learned like all of the woodwind instruments plus cello plus some violin, which is, I play the violin very badly. And I learned how to improvise and I was in jazz bands and I played the flute. Um, anyway, and I, I did that for a while and I was kind of active in the Western New York um, pit musician scene. And I started getting paid for playing, and I loved it. Um, but at the same time, I was a member of the Greater Buffalo Youth Orchestra, and I just started to fall in love with the orchestral repertoire and falling in love with like the oboe's role in that. So um, gradually, my mindset changed to focus more on oboe. And when I was 15, I decided to apply to the Interlochen Arts Academy, and I got in, and I studied with Dan Stolper there for two years, and then I auditioned for the Curtis Institute of Music, um, among many other conservatories that year, and got into Curtis, and I studied with Richard Woodhams for three years, and then during my third year, I took an audition for the Atlanta Symphony, and I won. (laughs) So that is my short, shortened version of my timeline, I guess. <laughs> Our listeners really love hearing about people's experience in auditioning from preparation to being there in the moment, advancing, 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 and then finally winning the position. Could you please talk to us about the process of winning your job in the ASO? Sure. I'll talk about my preparation first. I was... I was so focused. I just remember, well, I had the really great opportunity to play in Atlanta as a sub the summer before the audition. So I played this Beethoven festival with them and I just fell in love with the orchestra and I thought, yeah, this is something I would definitely like to be a part of. And uh, so I was really preparing. I had this whole chart on my wall in my apartment and I had every excerpt um, in a list, and every time I would really spend time and practice it, I would put a check mark next to it, just so visually I would see 
all of the work I had done. I also had, like, on my iPod at the time, this, like, audition playlist where um, I would take walks or do whatever, and it was just constantly playing the pieces that were part of the audition list. And so they just became, like, a part of me in a way. I just, um, I listened to them so much that uh, I wasn't scared of them anymore, I guess. And um, let's see, what else did I do? I I wasn't a good read maker then. I still am not a good read maker. <laughs> so I don't know how I pulled that one off. <laughs> um, I, I remember making reads a lot. Um, and... The audition for the ASO was kind of different than, like, the normal audition process. They did have a national audition that year, and it was a no-hire. And I had made it to the semifinal round of that audition, and they needed to fill out their next season um, with people that were potentially interested in the job and people that had advanced. So I think they, they took most of the semifinalists, from that first audition and then maybe some recommendations of other people that may not have taken the audition, but then were interested. Um, and they had people kind of like cycle in and play weeks with the orchestra and the way they did it since they had already had a national audition, the next audition, they could kind of structure it, um, the way they wanted. So they took all these people and they, after the weeks that they played, they said, does this person fit with us? Yes or no. And then they kept narrowing down the pool until it was just three people. And I was one of them. So I think that year I played, I went on a tour with them. I played, I think I played about nine weeks with the Atlanta Symphony. And then, uh, so each, each week was kind of like a trial week. And then we had, just with three people, an audition, a behind-the-screen audition where you had to advance, and then a semifinal round behind the screen. All of us advanced both of those rounds. And then, this is really cool, um, they had a rehearsal where the three of us just came in and played the excerpt list with the orchestra. And it was such a blessing because you actually got to, like, play it the way you hear it in your head and you're reacting to people and it was just so natural and and I ended up winning that audition in that way so it's not really the traditional way of like you know you start with a, a pool of 100 narrow it to 15 narrow it to five and then pick a winner kind of thing it was um it was a little different but it worked for them and I'm happy <laughs> So that's a really interesting audition trajectory. And we talk a lot on this podcast about the mental and emotional side of playing. And when you were telling that story, the first thing that was coming to my mind was, so you were there and you were playing with them, but you were also auditioning and in this constant state of assessment. So I would love to hear about your thoughts on performance anxiety and silencing the inner voice generally, but also how you feel or maybe strategized going about handling those things in this particular part of your career when you knew you were on the cusp of such a significant opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking back on that experience, you know, I was only 20, 20 years old, and I, I was 21 when I won the final audition, but um, when I was playing with them, I was 20, and I think I was pretty naive, honestly. I, I, I don't know, because maybe it was like technically my first audition, I don't know if I thought, oh, everything's going to be like this, you know, like, and I, I didn't have that sense of like, urgency like I still had more schooling more years of school I could choose to go to grad school I didn't feel this like timeline crunching me you know like oh I gotta get a job um I knew I wanted a job and I knew I wanted that job and I knew I wanted to make music but I didn't have that like um inner voice telling me like oh my god you have to be perfect they have to love you kind of thing and I just I've always kind of approached like making music with people as 
just be yourself and if they like it great <laughs> because I don't I don't want to only be somewhere because I'm trying to be somebody else or like um being an imitation of what I think somebody wants to hear you know like I I just was myself and I played like me and that that's kind of what was going on in my mind at the time um it also helped that the tour was like one of my absolute favorite pieces and I was lucky and I just I was in love with it. I was I was in love with playing it and I think that came through, you know, in my trial week. So I will always have a special place in my heart for Rachmaninoff symphonic dances. <laughs> so you talked about not loving your own reads and I completely identify with that because for me it's always the biggest struggle to make a read that I enjoy playing on and, and like and trust. So what was your read making strategy going into the audition and what advice can you give auditioners out there about their reads? I've come to the conclusion that there are only a few things that really matter. The read has to respond first and foremost. So when I'm making a read now, I make it to respond. Then I make it the next thing I focus on is intonation because those two things, they're kind of black and white, right? Like if the conductor points at you and like nothing comes out, but then like when it does come out, it's a beautiful tone. That doesn't really matter. Right. So, um, and if a conductor points at you and you play a solo and it's really flat, like that's a black and white issue. That's, you have to have those things. And if you have a read that responds and is in tune, it probably has a, a tone that is acceptable. And I've come to realize that there's a pretty wide range of tones that are acceptable and you always kind of sound like you. So no matter what you're playing on something, you have like this instinctual sound and um, it will always come out. So I've learned to focus less and less on tone, but more on, response and intonation I you know I studied with Richard Woodrums and I love him and he was the right person for me and but he really I remember him once telling me this is my my read advice that I got from him it's like well Liz you just gotta scrape it till it sounds good <laughs> and I was like wait can you give me a little more <laughs> how what do I do and he left it up to me, and in a way, I think he was trying to get people to develop something that um, works best for them and creates a sound for them that is unique in themselves and expresses who they are and what they want to sound like instead of like trying to be this carbon copy of him or whoever you know you might love. And I've never been a great read maker but I've always been able to play on reads that are not quite perfect and I think that's a good skill to have as an oboist because then you can kind of release some anxiety about um, oh my god my read's not exactly the way I want and if it's not exactly the way I want then I won't be able to play the way I want like I can kind of manipulate them in a way where I, I've just learned over the years how to do it instead of stressing about it. <laughs> um, Richard Woodhams is such a legendary performer and teacher, and I wonder if you could give us a little insight into what you learned um, from studying with him and some um, more um, pictures into, you know, his teaching style or anything that you feel comfortable sharing. Well, I think the biggest lesson um, that I took away from him that I still think about on a daily basis is just he was so focused on line and uh, phrasing. And honestly, phrasing in its simplest form, like you start here, you're going there, and you're ending here. And breaking things down into a very simple and very honest way of playing and I hear that with all the all of the students, um, and I, I love that 
kind of playing. It's very vocal. It's not, you know, trying to be flowery or um, just like over the top with expression. It's very honest. And, uh, you know, we've, <laughs> I hardly worked on repertoire or excerpts with him. We, my first year there, we worked on Barrett. I started with the, the 40 melodies and went to the grand studies. My second year, we worked on Fairling into my third year. We also kept working on Fairling. We'd go back to Barrett. Um, once a year, we had a oboe recital, so we would work on, uh, a piece of repertoire with him. And if I was taking an audition, he would, you know, spend time with me on, on the list, which I was very grateful for. But he was, he could be very tough. And I had experienced many lessons where I was, you know, feeling pretty low afterwards. Um, But I came to the realization it's, it's because he cared so much. He cared so much about his students and he cared really so much about the music. And he instilled this kind of, um, integrity for the music in, in his students that I think about every day and I'm so glad he did. Um, yeah, so we had a lesson once a week, usually on Mondays with him and, uh, we had woodwind class on Mondays as well. But honestly, my biggest teacher was listening to him in the orchestra. And Curtis, we had a great program where they would give us free tickets to the Philadelphia Orchestra concerts. And sometimes I went twice a week. I mean, I I listened to him play all of this repertoire and concertos. And, and that's how I learned how to play and Lobo. I mean, he... He was such a leader musically, and he was so expressive, and he could, he can do um, things with just one note that would just give you chills. And I don't, I mean, he's a master of color. It was just a really incredible experience to be able to hear him every week. Well, that's kind of the perfect segue to another question that we really love to ask when we have principal players on the podcast, which is, can you talk to us about how you approach that specific role and leadership position within the orchestral woodwind section? My style, I guess, is to lead by example. And I always try and come as prepared as possible and um, be as you know excited about the music as possible and hopefully that will like have this effect on my colleagues and and I and I know that it does because I get that effect from other colleagues of mine in the orchestra and um what I love about playing Prince Lobo is like I said I, I loved musical theater and so I was part of that world for a while and in a way, you can become an actress um, for an hour or so, and you can kind of develop characters in your mind or or storylines or whatever you want and and get into character and, and play. And, and that's what I love about the oboe so much, honestly, is because we have such an integral role of telling the story that the composer wanted. I mean, we, we can break people's hearts. We can be the comedian. We could be crass. We could be rude, you know, and, and just like grabbing that character and having that, um, like embodying that is really fun for me. And I love doing it every week. (laughs) So playing principal oboe in a major orchestra is, seriously difficult work and it's hard on your body and um I'm curious as to what you do to take care of your body and your spirit to keep yourself in tip-top shape um well I think that's I think that's really important for people to understand um if I don't feel like I'm in shape and I don't have to be in like super 
Superman shape or whatever, but just like feeling like my I'm healthy and strong. Um, if I don't feel that way, then I know my breath control will suffer. My mood will suffer. My, you know, just energy levels suffer. And that will all play a part in the music. So I always try and I do. I exercise a lot. Um, I love to hike and walk and uh, I am part of like this boot camp group. Like we meet every weekend and I don't work out. <laughs> but, um, I know like it, it's super important to me and I, I wish I had realized that a little bit earlier in my life, but um, it's probably in the last eight years that I've really been aware of that fact and working, you know, to improve my body, but also knowing that in turn that will improve my oboe playing. I, when I prepare for a concerto, I'm really dedicated, like trying, trying to like be in great shape, but also like nutritionally trying to take care of myself and getting enough sleep. And I, I just know that I need to put myself and my body in the best condition it can be in because the oboe is just, it, it could just hurt you, you know, <laughs> just sitting making reads or sitting practicing or the amount of air pressure. It, it's probably not very good for us. So, you know, counteracting that is really important. And spiritually, um, just like, Finding beauty in things is very important for me. Um, I I love being outside. Um, I love being in nature. Yeah, so I, I do find some inspiration, a lot of inspiration from from that. And also, like to put yourself in a good mindset, like being able to let go of a a bad performance or a mistake, or um, being able to forgive yourself for whatever it may be, um, not spending enough time at the read desk and in turn not having a great performance or just being able to like let go of things and move forward is really healthy and it helps a lot to stay sane when you're playing oboe in a, in a professional orchestra. I think that is so spot on, but I think that perspective is also something that a lot of people struggle with. So I wonder, is that something that came very naturally to you or was that a skill that you had to develop over time? I think it's always come naturally to me to be able to like let go of things. There are some things that are harder to let go, of course, but I, forgiveness is like a, important in all aspects of life, I think, but you have to not only forgive others, but like be able to forgive yourself and, and know that just think about like the big picture. Like, yeah, maybe you missed an attack or maybe you played a wrong note in a concert or maybe you did this, like maybe you came in wrong or whatever. And instead of like dwelling on it and making that ruin the rest of your, your performance or your night or your week or whatever it may be. Um, just like, saying okay bye <laughs> that happened now it's gone and I need to <laughs> I need to let go <laughs> so given your busy schedule how do you manage and approach your practice time in order to make it as effective as possible yeah efficiency is like the most important thing to me <laughs> I don't want to spend four hours a night with the oboe I mean I'd come out with like my back killing me and you know what I mean? Like, I just don't want to do it. So I, I always tell my students this, but I tell myself this too, practice the things you're not good at. <laughs> and, and so I do, like if I'm learning a piece of music, I'll spend a lot more time on the things that I'm not good at or I'm not comfortable with. And, you know, trust that the things that I know that I can do will happen. And, um, I have to be extra efficient because my husband is also a musician and we share a studio. So we also share, you know, we, we have to schedule our practice times and we have to um, schedule our teaching times too. So I, I know what I have to do for that slotted amount of time. And, um, and I try and get as much of it done as I can, you know? Um, but I try not to, you know, I turn, I put my phone on do not disturb and I, I try not to look at it, but 
one kind of important piece of advice that was given to me um, when I was really young, probably my first teacher, Mark Dubois, um, probably when I was in sixth grade, he told me, if you're in the practice room and your mind is just not there, if you're just thinking about something else and you're just playing and you're not really there, just stop. Go do something else, clear your mind, and come back because it's just it's a waste of time at that point. So if that ends up happening to me, if I'm like, you know, practicing and my mind is just completely elsewhere, I'll just stop and I'll come back to it later. Same with read making too. I mean, if I'm not, if there's kind of like this vibe that happens in the read room, I'm sure you guys both feel it. Like you start, you kind of know, Oh, this is going to be a good day or this is not going to be a good day. You know? So if I feel that like, okay, things are not working today, I'll just put it away and come back tomorrow <laughs> because I need to save, save my sanity. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of how I approach practicing. It's being really efficient, practicing the things I'm not good at. Um, I don't really have like a warm up routine, but it always kind of includes some sort of scale or long tone or lyrical melody in the beginning just to like see where my air and read are for the day and then probably a little read adjustment or whatever it needs and then I'll I'll practice my repertoire what are some of your favorite pieces to play besides the Rachmaninoff symphonic dances I will never ever tire of playing a Brahms symphony I could play a Brahms symphony every week and probably be happy for the rest of my life. I know it's like really corny to say this, but usually the thing that's on my stand, I'm, I can find some kind of joy from. And so I usually am in love. Well, usually, not always, but usually I really enjoy playing the piece that I'm, that's in front of me that week. I'll never tire of, I love playing Schubert 9. I love playing Scheherazade. Oh, you know, I love playing Tombo. I've played it many times and it, it doesn't, it doesn't scare me anymore and it's just so perfect. I just, <laughs> I get so excited. <laughs> you picked the right job then. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I love my job. I, I love it. Yeah. Do you have any stories of a memorable performance that you could tell us about? Sure. Um, you know, the things you remember are always the things that like go wrong. <laughs> and those are the ones that you remember forever. Usually if everything goes right, I, I feel like I'm kind of like in a trance and I, I barely remember it after. But like the things that go wrong. Uh, yeah. Well, OK, so I have two stories to tell you. One is my very first year in the orchestra. Um, it was like maybe my second month. We were playing Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. And we had four performances of it. So the first night went well. And I thought to myself, you know, tomorrow night, I'm not going to play that 2D at the end of the first movement. I'm just going to take a break, get mentally prepared for second movement and it will be even better so I um did I didn't play and then I also didn't soak my read at all <laughs> I was oh no second movement <laughs> you know Atlanta is like pretty humid place but in the winter it's very dry and this was probably late November like mid-November or something. Oh. and so he starts the second movement not one thing came out of my elbow. Not a sound. No. I, mean, I was like, what do I do? <laughs> Luckily, I mean, no string player had started, right? Because I didn't start. <laughs> and so he, like, put his arms down, and Robert Spano is the person that was conducting, and I was terrified, and I had this read that was... Soaking the entire first movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, I already know this one doesn't work. So I switched reads. 
<laughs> and I like clamped down on the thing and I prayed. Oh no. And somehow I got through it. I don't remember. I can't bring myself to listen to that. <laughs> that um, oh replay or whatever, the recording of the, of the piece. But I, <laughs> you know, people were like, I think it, I think it actually went okay, honestly. But I was just so mortified that I could, I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to get tenure. I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm, why do I have this job? You know, I was just like doubting myself. Like, how could I have done this? And so after the concert, I went down to Robert's office because I was like, oh, I have to apologize and tell him that tomorrow I'll definitely be more aware of the readiness of my reads. And so I went down there and I apologized. And he said, why are you apologizing? You know, was I know now that you can work under pressure. And I was like, oh, my God. That was like the best thing I could have heard. I was so yeah. Um, That's the best thing anybody could have said in that moment. Yeah, and I was, you know, I still was mortified that that had happened, but I felt like okay, you know, in the scheme of things, something like that, even though it seems like this huge deal in the moment, it's not really that big of a deal. Like life goes on, you know, and so I was very grateful to Robert for that. And, and you also don't know, like, how it comes across either, you know? Because, like, it probably came across beautifully. And it's just your feeling about it that feels off. Yeah. <laughs> and so the next story I have to tell just happened to me recently. And I was playing the Mozart Concerto with the Atlanta Symphony. And Carlo Rizzi was conducting. And Carlo is a left-handed conductor. And... um I was using music, and so the gestures with his left hand were kind of bigger, right? And he had created this breeze, I guess, because of his large, excited motions. <laughs> and it, it caught my music and turned the page. And so I, he actually saw it, and... He got off the podium and flipped my page back. He's actually an oboist, so I guess he would know, I don't know, where I was or something. And uh, he flipped the page back, but as soon as he got on the podium again, it caught my music again and shut the page. Oh, no. And at this, you know, the audience is going like, <gasps> like all these steps and stuff. And then, like, I made, I made a mistake, and he looked at me, and he just stopped the concert. And... Uh, because I, at that point I was just like, in my mind, I was like, what do I do? What do I do? I think I have this memorized. I've played it a million times, but like, I wasn't focused. I was just like totally scattered. And I, so I, we started again and he made some joke about how he was creating wind and the audience laughed or it's it like a fart joke. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I moved my stand slightly away from him and we started again at the da 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 we started there. And from that moment on, I have absolutely no memory of playing the piece. No oh at all. So I walk off stage. It was like complete autopilot. And I, I walk off stage and all my colleagues are like, oh my God. I can't believe that how you handled that was like so great. And I was crying. I was upset. I was so like, I felt in the moment, I felt like, oh my God, if I would have just memorized this piece, like this, I, this serves me right. This is karma, you know, stuff like really negative thoughts. And I was really upset. So fast forward a couple weeks, what is it called? The recording engineer for the symphony came up to me with the, uh, broadcast edition, you know, of the, of the piece that he was gonna give to the public radio station to broadcast. And so I asked him, you know, which night is that? And he said, oh, it's, it's Saturday night. And that's the night that that happened. And I said, really? And I listened to it, you know, I, I listened to it and it sounds, sounds fine. I, and I can't, it sounds great, actually. I'm really proud of it. And it's just amazing to me. And it taught me a lot, actually. It, it just, that if you're really prepared, 
and you <laughs> you know well enough to go on autopilot even if you're in this like panic mode that like you something inside you just takes over and if your mind is elsewhere you can still create beautiful music and um so yeah I, it, in a way that was a, a cool lesson and um I don't recommend people to try that at home that really sucked in the moment but um I did learn a lot from that in a way so those are my two horror stories <laughs> Those were incredible. I had one other story. Please. So the night before my audition, um, that, you know, the audition I was talking about before where there was just like three people, the final audition for the ASO, I decided I'm not going to like sit in my hotel room and worry and get nervous. They had a concert that night. I was going to go to the concert. And I had asked the personnel manager because I – had a relationship with the whole orchestra because I had played there for nine weeks. I had asked him, you know, is it okay if after the concert I can just like test my read on stage, like play a few notes? And he said, yeah, it's totally fine. So I had my oboe with me and um, I was listening to the first half of the concert, really enjoying it. And then they knew I was there because I had written to our personnel manager and he comes running down during intermission and he's like, Liz, our second oboist, got sick. Like, at the time, she had just recovered from some surgery or something. It, it was reacting with her in a weird way. So she was falling asleep on stage. Um, and he said, can you can you play? And I was like, well, yeah, I can play. And so me and her name was Deborah Workman. She was the former second oboist in the ASL. We swapped clothes in the bathroom. And I walk out on stage. Dwight Perry is the person that's playing principal that week because it was during that the season where they had to, like, you know, fill in the, for principal Obo. And I had never met him before. I think he had just won Cincinnati. And he looks at me and he's like, have you ever played Copeland 3 before? And I'm like, nope, I've never even heard it. <laughs> and so he oh my God. Just, like, quickly goes through, like, this is exposed, this is exposed, let's try this, it's a duet, this is your solo, this is this. And I just, like, I got through, like, we we worked for, like, 10 minutes. And then concert started. And it it went well. And I I was, like, I didn't, I never heard the piece. And then the, the part, the fanfare for the common man part happened. And I was, like, oh, okay, I've heard this before. <laughs> and I'm, like, we keep going. And uh, it went well. Robert ended up giving me a, like, special acknowledgement, like, second oboe solo bow <laughs> and um that actually was in a weird way a blessing in disguise because it totally made the next morning way less i i was way less in my head because i had just done that <laughs> anyway that was a crazy story too i feel like cool under that. pressure is such an understatement for you <laughs> <laughs> i read this article once like i saw this article on like BuzzFeed or something like that is about a type B personality and I have never ever read anything that has defined me more than that article <laughs> wow and I was like <laughs> okay I yeah and you know it's funny you think like oboists are very type A you have to be type A you have to be like super organized and really like have routines and all this stuff and I guess I do you know have somewhat of a routine that works for me but to anyone else looking at me, they think, oh, my God, you're, like, way too chilled out to be an oboe player. <laughs> <laughs> we do have the opposite reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so switching gears a little bit, um, you're not just a performer. You're also a teacher. And I'd like to know a little bit more about your approach to teaching and maybe some favorite repertoire that you like to use in your teaching. I, I've had some really fantastic students, um, and I've been really blessed that, you know, some of them have gone into music and starting to have a career of their own. And um, I remember thinking when I had the opportunity to teach someone at that, that had that kind of talent and was just a really superstar student, I remember saying to myself, 
I'm never going to tell her that something is hard. Because if I tell her, oh, this is really, really hard, she may just, like, somehow get this mental block of, like, oh, and somehow look at it differently instead of having this open-minded approach and very um, uh, t- take on anything kind of attitude. And so I still to this day, I try and I try and not give people judgment about certain aspects of oboe playing or um, repertoire, because I feel like if you kind of, give them your own jaded viewpoint of it, it will become theirs and it may necessarily not have to be theirs. So some of my favorite things to teach, I love fairling. I think it's so vocal and challenging in all the right ways. And so I, I end up teaching a lot of fairling, but um, yeah. What advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? Give yourself the best chance at it, I guess, would be my answer. So listen to as much music as you can. I mean, things are so different now, and students now have, like, a library constantly available to them in their hands. Like, they have access to so many recordings um, and IMSLP and all of this stuff that wasn't there when I was a student. So there really is no excuse not to have listened to a piece anymore. Um, I think embrace all kinds of music, not just oboe music. Um, listen to chamber music, string chamber music, pianists, vocalists. Um, listen to contemporary music. Listen to pop music. Listen, you're you're gonna grab things from everything that you hear that you like and and somehow it will be embedded in you and your performance and your style of music making. Um, And I think a really big piece of advice that I could give people that want to be a musician is just be kind, like be a nice person (laughs) to the people, everyone that you meet, because you really never know who's going to be that person to give you your first break or, You know, like, I get hired for festivals now from colleagues that I met in college or high school at Interlochen. And being a nice person and being prepared and trustworthy and is really, really important. And it goes a long way. Being a good colleague is so important. Yeah, just also just, like, be curious and let yourself be curious. And don't be closed-minded to, oh, there's only one way to play the oboe. Or I only, like classical music I don't like jazz or you know like there's just have an open mind and you will learn things from everything if you let yourself Liz it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you I was smiling and nodding the whole time (laughs) (laughs) Um, in closing could you tell us about some of your upcoming performances and uh, where our listeners can find you on the internet Let's see. On the internet, I don't have a website, but I have a Facebook page and an Instagram page. Um, my Instagram page is mainly pictures of pretty things. <laughs> it's less about the oboe. Um, I do share like stuff about oboe on my Facebook page. And um, also, let's see. Oh, upcoming performances. Next week, I'm playing with the Grand Teton Music Festival, and we're playing Mahler's Third Symphony. And... In two weeks or three weeks, I'll be at the IDRS convention and I will play the Bliss Quintet um, in one of the evening concerts. I'm really excited about that. The Atlanta Symphony has made a lot of recordings and I have a few recordings on YouTube. So yeah, you can find me there. (laughs) Great. Thank you so, so much. Thank you guys. This was great.
We hope you enjoyed that interview with Liz Cook to Shone. Do not forget to rate and review on iTunes. We certainly appreciate when you do that. You can also be sure to follow us on social media at Double Read Dish. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you want to follow us individually, we are at Hello Oboe and Wilson Bassoon on Instagram. Galit, who do we have coming up next? Our next guest is Dr. Eric Stomberg, professor of bassoon at the University of Kansas and also the president of the International Double Read Society. All right, Jackie, time to end the nerd parade. I'm going to go make reads. Mm, Bye. (laughs) 